welcome to the Build Business Acumen Podcast, where we deliver practical knowledge and powerful guidance. Here is your futuristic host, Nathaniel Schooler. In this episode, I'm interviewing Mark Renier, and he was the founder and CEO of Brook Laddie Distillery, which, if you're into whiskey, you will know about Brook Laddie. It's single malt, uh, fantastic whiskies. And these guys actually sold the business for for fifty eight million to Remy Quantro in July twenty twelve. And Mark has actually been involved in the drinks industry his whole working life. And for forty years, next year he would have actually spent twenty years in whiskey and twenty years in the wine industry. He joined his family's wine shipping firm in 1980, where they bottled wines and distributed. Then he went into wholesale restaurant sales before creating his own retail wine business in 1995, after a short stint with a West Country brewer, Eldridge Pope. And it was here that he first experienced single malt whiskies used for blending in bulk the brewer's Ken Blended Whiskey. Brook Laddie was the only single malt stocked at his shop at La Reserve in Knightsbridge and a distillery that was purchased in 2000 and developed until 2012 when it was acquired by Remy Quantro along with a creation of theirs called the Botanist Gin. And since then, Renegade Rum has actually been created. It's a distillery project which is due to come online in August 2019 and that's actually on the island of Grenada and Waterford Distillery was created in Ireland in 2016 and that actually is going to be the first Irish single malt which will be released in 2020. So Mark shares so much value in this episode. I think you're going to like it. We go through all sorts of amazing information. And yeah, it's a great episode. If you want to learn about the drinks industry, a bit about the history of Grenada and the history of wine, it's super interesting. And we talk about his his, uh, passion, which is bringing terroir to spirits and terroir is the ground that uh, the ingredients are grown on and what flavors that imparts upon the actual drink itself so let's get into the show well hi there mark morning 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 we haven't actually met in in person but i've sort of followed your uh, antics one might say over the <laughs> over the last kind of almost 20 years like you like you like you said earlier yeah I watched the Brook Laddie distillery go from being defunct to having this amazing sort of flashy new packaging and, and, and all these amazing kind of press releases. And I'm super interested to hear about the Renegade Rum distillery that you're involved with and also the, the Waterford distillery as well. Well, yeah, they all, they all flow out of the same, the same concept. As you said, it was December the 19th, 2000, that we bought uh, Brook Laddie. A day I remember extremely well. It was, it was a, a very tight uh, deadline and we, we you know it was all or nothing and it very nearly didn't happen at all and then to crown it all my son was born late the same day so it, it's a it's a it, it's a day that's firmly firmly uh, emblazoned on my on my on my memory in my mind but uh, this year 2019 it's a dividing line for me it's it's, it's exactly half my career has been in wine and the other half in spirit. So there's quite a, a pertinent sort of landmark for me because what I've been doing with spirit is applying very much a wine trade uh, philosophy to what I saw as a, um, a rather staid industry, which, which we used to, you know, in the wine trade, we always call the spirit side, the, you know, the dark side. You know, it, it was everything the wine trade isn't. You know, it's a very consolidated, extremely rich industry, whereas the wine trade is uh, fragmented, a lot of small producers, hands-on, uh, a lot of passionate people, and you know, completely unsophisticated in, in comparison to the, the spirits industry. And, and so when I went from wine to, to the spirits, it was 
I, I really felt that I was going to the dark side. It was, it was, you know, I was making a deliberate move into something uh, which, which, you know, for much of my life I despised. What I find quite interesting is you're, you're bringing the, I mean, for people that don't understand about wine, you and I both know that, I don't know who said it originally, but good wine is made in the vineyard, right? I mean, that's what, yeah. that's, mm -hmm. we know that, yeah? So yeah. that, and that goes all the way down into the soil from the nutrients that come up through the soil. They call it in France, terroir, don't they? And what I find fascinating is you're actually bringing that into the spirits that you guys are in the process of making. I mean, I know you've, have you actually completed the building of the Renegade distillery yet in Grenada or is that? No, that's, that's in the process of happening. Uh, we're at foundation level at the moment. We're just coming out of the ground and we should be operational um, in the summer. So that's where we are with that. That's using uh, sugar cane to make rum. In Ireland, we've got a, a, what was a Guinness brewery built in 2004, very, very, very modern. And we converted it into a distillery in 2015 and uh, have been distilling terroir derived spirit there, whiskey, since then. And that follows on from, from, from the Brook Laddie story, which started in, in 2000. But when I was uh, in my wine career, I was around when a great sort of phase of change was occurring. The post-war wine trade in France was where, I mean, you all remember these wine lakes, uh, massive overproduction. It was all very uh, communistic, you know, in, into these uh, uh, large-scale cooperatives. It was all about volume and yield, and huge amounts of fertilizer and uh, um, whack down. The whole thing, the whole idea of terroir that had defined a lot of these vineyard areas, particularly Burgundy, was just chucked out the window in, in this, this search for volume. It also follows a series of pretty difficult vintages. You know, the wineries, the, the chateaus of Bordeaux, they're all losing money hand over fist. They had no money to, to reinvest. The knowledge, the scientific knowledge just wasn't there. And, and it was the Australian, Californian universities, wine universities, that actually understood the technology needed, the machinery, the science, it was a sort of third generation of Frenchmen who came back from these wineries and sort of reclaimed their family inheritances, the, 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 the estates that had been rented out um, in those, those sad years of the 50s and 60s. And these were the guys that rediscovered terroir, and it's always been there, and it fundamentally reduced the yields proved the winemaking quality and of course the, the knowledge to to be able to deal with the issues that that meant that you know really now you don't really get bad vintages anymore in france they can deal with them they've got machineries they've got technologies reverse osmosis all sorts of things which means that the economic viability is is nothing like it was in those difficult years post-war years where the lack of investment just just really was dire and so the 90s or certainly the late, late 80s and 90s was an era where where there was um a great excitement that there was the understanding of working with wood barrels you know the forests of Trancey and Allier and Vosges and Limousin you know barrel makers were starting to come up with with you know much better quality uh, woods and wineries were learning how to use those woods uh, to influence the, the, the quality of their wines. And fundamentally, it was a question of not using too flavoursome a wood to, unless the wine could actually handle it. That was one of the very interesting factors that I, I learned. Um, very big influence on me. Equally, the organic movement, organic wine movement, and fundamentally, the biodynamic wine movement. Um, and that was something that I really found very interesting indeed. It's intriguing to see now a lot of the agricultural bodies in, in Ireland and Scotland and England, they're all now promoting very much uh, a soil improvement program. It's all about the soil. And of course, that's fundamentally what uh, biodynamics is about. I was there when these were happening, young winemakers taking over, reclaiming family estates and starting to apply a, a lot greater 
attention to detail. It wasn't, you know, old Jean-Pierre sort of sitting around the back of his winery. This is now, you know, scientific. It was a lot more inspired. And I just happened to be there at the right time. So, you know, coming from a wine family, my grandfather was a wine importer, my father. I had been exposed to wine since a very, very early age. It's in my blood, I suppose you could say. It then struck me as the single malt whiskey boom started around about 84, 85, that really when I got involved with that through a retail wine business I had in London, that was the sort of the, the, the changeover. As you started to see these stocks of old rums, and sorry, old whiskies first and then rums, suddenly becoming available, whiskies that came from an era of the 60s, uh, pre-industrial distillation eras. Uh, it, was, it was interesting to get involved in on a retail basis and then from a retail basis into a wholesale and production basis, an independent bottling concept where you'd buy barrels of whiskey and bottle it yourself. So there was a sort of trade a changeover era, uh, round about sort of 84, 5, 6, where I got involved in, in whiskey. And you couldn't help but wonder, you know, surely, surely to God, we can do this better. There must be a better way of doing this. And that's when I got into this idea of wanting to distill my own whiskey. It, it just seemed that there was an opportunity there, that it was just being massively underestimated and missed. And that's when uh, the whole Brook Laddie story came along. I mean, I, I sort of watched, I watched Brook Laddie, found it very interesting because um, I know you know my godfather, John, and he was telling me about the sign that kept going missing. I just find that story hilarious, you know, about, uh, is it clack and a choin that, that are the words that are on the back of the, the, back of the bottle, right? Clack and a choin was a, a, a tongue-in-cheek motto that we used in the early days. It was basically, you know, how, how, how on earth can you explain that this is the real deal, that what we're offering is the dog's bollocks? <laughs> and and that's, that's when we came up with, with, with you know, we, we had to translate dog's bollocks into, into Gallic. And, and we had a flag, you see, we had a flag made of it. Uh, we used to fly it from the distillery. And then every now and again, it would go missing. And it, was, it, it had been up for about four years, I think it was. And then suddenly, somebody may join the dots and realise what it meant. And um, I think it was some old dairy who took, took exception and, and, and it nicked it. So it, it, was, it just laughed, made me laugh, the fact that it was there for four years and no one even noticed. But yes, that, that, was, that was a bit of time. It did make me smile, I must admit. I saw you guys had webcams 24 hours a day. You had webcams at Brook Laddie before people even started using webcams. Again, there's, there's a method to it. Uh, the reason was uh, Brook Laddie, when we bought it in, in, in 2000, it was a shut down, closed, defunct distillery. It had you know, rust everywhere. It had weeds growing out of the gutters. You know, it, 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 was, it was a very, very sad, sad place. But inside it was all this wonderful Victorian engineering. It was built in 1881 by three brothers, the Harvey brothers. And you know, remember, you know, the, the Hebrides was coming out of this awful potato famine era, emigration across to, you know, to America, overpopulation. It was a really down period. The island was, was, you know, was bankrupt, had been bankrupt, had been bought by the, 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 the Morrison family. The distillery, Brookladdy and Buna Harbin, were both built the same year, 1881, as modern distilleries. Up to then, the distilleries in the Hebrides had been farms and mills, and they were, they were very small scale, and they'd evolved from those earlier enterprises into, into distilleries. And you, can, you don't see any of the ones that are in these places, and you can see the origins. Of, of these distilleries. Uh, Lefroy, particularly, the size of the stills, these little s small dinky stills that were you know, the size, the maximum size you could fit into a, into a, a, a buyer. And those still shapes are still used today. When Brook Laddie and Buna Harbin were built, they were built as deliberately, for the first time on the island, as distilleries. 
And uh, the catalyst for that was the steam boats, the puffers, that had suddenly appeared and connected these remote islands to Glasgow and, of course, to fuel, coal, and barley. And so it made sense for, for the first time to actually build a state-of-the-art distillery. And I think the credit to the design was that this state-of-the-art design was, is, is just as effective today as it was, you know, 130 or so years ago. That's very interesting. So what, what made you decide to pick Grenada as your other distillery outside of the UK? Well, it's the same principles. And really going from Isla, where we have the chance to make, to make a difference, to actually you know, do it my way. I'm not, I'm not saying you know, this is how everybody should be doing these things. It's, it's what I think whiskey should be made. It's how I think Irish whiskey should be made. And of course, rum is one of them. You know, you know, this is how I think rum should be made. Now, the same evolution from wine to, to whiskey also occurred with rum. At the same time, we were buying barrels of rum from distilleries that no longer existed. The Caribbean, particularly, a lot of distilleries free, well, you know, from the colonial era, era were suffering from a lack of investment, a lack of care and attention, overstaffed, poorly run, and they were falling like flies as efficiency just got worse and worse and worse. And this coincided with the collapse of, of, of sugar pricing, sugar refining. It, it seemed to me that a lot of these distilleries that had gone, that had disappeared, it was all fun bottling up their rums but you realize, you know, it, it wasn't a terribly good business model because, you know, the very nature of the fact was, you know, they shut down. There wasn't going to be much rum around. And this was duly the case after seven or eight years of bottling up these rums under a, a little label we created called Renegade Rum. Quality of the rums available and the pricing, the pricing went up and the quality went down and the availability collapsed. So it, again, it came to a sort of Brook Laddie type moment where you had to, you know, if this was going to carry on, we're going to have to try and find our own distillery, our own supply. And so a 10 year journey started where I tried to find, like Brook Laddie, an old distillery that I could buy with stocks that we could then market and bottle. But it swiftly became apparent that one, there were no stocks out there. And secondly, the, the quality of the distilleries was, was lamentable. I scoured the, the Pacific, Fiji, Reunion, Mauritius, the Caribbean, you know, Cuba, Jamaica, St. Lucia. And you know, all you found were, were distilleries that were really, you know, frankly, you know, had seen better days would be a, an understatement. So it appeared this was going to work. We were going to have to build our own distillery, that there wasn't anything worth buying. They were environmentally compromised. They were ancient. They were beyond redemption, in my view. Some people would say they're traditional. <laughs> um, I think sometimes that can be a, a euphemism for beyond the pale. Anyhow, so we started building uh, our own distillery, which, which is using a lot of the technologies that we learned in Ireland, obviously from Brooklady as well, and putting in place a very smart, self-contained, standalone distillery, which is environmentally you know, really with it up there. In fact, we started, the whole design started with what are we going to do with the waste stream? And we started from there and we've worked back. So we've designed a distillery unlike any other. We've used, we've not We've not tried to follow what you know, other rum distilleries do. In fact, we've deliberately prevented that. We don't want to be uh, influenced by anything that's gone before. So we've deliberately, we've really deconstructed it and started again. So this isn't a, a sugar refinery trying to make rum, which is how most of them started. This is starting out from the premises. You know, how can we make? The question I'm trying to answer is, how can you make 
a profound rum. How can you make a rum that's as complex as a single malt whiskey? And that's the philosophical proposition that I'm setting out to answer. I had a little look at the investor document. John, John gave me the investor document because I was talking to him about rum. And then I went and I, I read that and I sort of had a look and I learned a lot about rum from that and doing, doing a bit of research as well. And what I find fascinating is, is that you're actually in control of the whole process. So you are, from what I understand, you're going to be in control of growing the sugarcane as well and actually the variety of sugarcane that's going to marry with the barrels that you're going to age the rum well yeah well more or less uh, most rum again you know this, this is a looking at it from a wine point of view it's a very simple philosophy that you know 90 percent of rum is made from molasses uh, now molasses is the crap that's left over after sugar is made it's one of the reasons why rum's never really been taken seriously it's always been frivolous. It's always been a bit of a easy come, easy go sort of drink. And that stems from, you know, how it was made. You know, it was made as a, as, as a freebie. It was made by local sugar refiners. At the end of the day, when you, when you had all this gloop left over from sugar making, you know, add some water to it and cook it up and you've got rum. It's like grappa. You know, nobody takes grappa seriously you know you don't take grappa as seriously as you take cognac you know one is a primary raw ingredient and the other one is a byproduct one is made from the stems and pips you know left over after the wine's been made it's it's one of those a uh, winter consumed spirits you know that country folk have it's a bonus it's a gift and that's very much what rum has always been it's been a, a bonus an add-on very cheap to produce and so therefore, it's always been a bit frivolous, in my view. And it's, you know, it, it readily lends itself to that marketing of you know, pirates and sun, sea and sex. And uh, it's not ever been really taken seriously. And the only people that have tried to take it seriously are the French in Martinique and Guadeloupe, where they distill not molasses, but the sugarcane. They use the sugarcane as the primary raw ingredient. And this was forced on them, incidentally, by, by Admiral Lord Nelson when he blockaded the island and they couldn't get their sugar away back to France. And so they ended up distilling it. So, so I suppose the Brits, uh, once again, are probably to blame for, you know, for, for that uh, um, happy coincidence. Um, so I, so I'm, very, I'm very happy to take it a step further, which is you know, to deliberately stand out with, on the basis that we're going to use sugar cane, and therefore, if you're using the plant as the primary raw ingredient, it therefore follows that where that plant grows, how it grows, is going to determine the quality of sugar juice you get from it, or cane juice, and therefore fermentation, distillation, it should come through in the spirit once it's distilled. And so that is the premise of this project, that we are using sugarcane only, and that we will have been over the last three years propagating sugarcane in a variety of different terroirs around the island, from the north to the south, all down the east coast, at varying different altitudes, you know, from sea level to a thousand feet. And we are seeing the cane response grows differently on these different volcanic soils, alluvial soils. You know, it's, it's basic farming that we've been doing for the last three years. And now we're building the distillery, having proven to ourselves that we can grow enough cane so that it can supply the distillery. So it's a bit back to front. We've had to grow the cane first and then build the distillery. From what I gather, you're going to be harvesting one fermentation amount of sugar cane. So... It's not gonna. It's not gonna have a chance to sit out there in the sun and get damaged, or even sit overnight. Yeah. So when you start going down this line, when you really accept the fact that you know we're going to use sugarcane rather than generic molasses, molasses has been so successful because you know it's, it's like diesel. You can you can just order it wherever you are in the world and and distill away. And so people do. So so rum distillation. It, it, it rum is produced all over the world. 
there are very, very few rules and regulations, which, of course, the drinks industry loves because, you know, the fewer the rules, uh, you know, the more sort of shenanigans that they can get up to. Well, I'm throwing that all back and saying, look, I, I'm going back to an agricultural concept, exactly as I did with Brook Laddie, the same with, with Waterford and Ireland, which is the drinks industry, 90% of it is all about marketing and about spinning a yarn, telling a story, why you should drink this or put hairs in your chest, blah, 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 blah. And very, very little, 10%, is about the production. The production is about producing a standardized, homogenized, cheapest unit of alcohol possible. Yeah. And then, you know, the story, the yarn is spun at the other end. And I took this back to basics, right back to the barley, that if you're going to talk about whiskey, if you're going to talk about rum or Irish whiskey, it's about the barley or the cane that went into it. And so I am putting all the effort into the origin. And that is my marketing. That is my story. I'm taking, I'm just turning the whole thing back to front and taking it back to the ground. We did this with barley on Isla growing, you know, persuading farmers who hadn't grown barley since the First World War to grow barley again, to show that different fields will produce a spirit that is different. And you know when you've got it right, when we used to invite some of the farmers down to the distillery and you'd give them a sample of the new spirit produced from their fields. And you see these big, gruff farmers uh, smelling, nosing the spirit. And, and before long, they're trying to discuss or argue uh, with their neighbors about why their spirit is different to their own. And, you know, you get these guys saying, well, you know, we, we planted our barley on the same day. Uh, we, we, we harvested it pretty, you know, how come yours is different to mine? And you get one of them saying, well, you know, you know, I'm a bit closer, you know, I've got more sand where we are and you've got a bit more clay where you are. But, you know, perhaps you get these farmers rationalizing why this spirit that they produce is different from their neighbors. And that, to me, is the great excitement of doing this. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to lay down a spirit for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you know, for God's sake, let's start with something a, li a little bit more interesting than just some, some homogenized, standardized thing where, you know, the barley comes from a Euro market. You know, you know, it says Scotch whiskey on it, but it's probably from, you know, Ukraine or, you know, sort of Central Europe or, you know, it's got nothing Scotch about it. Uh, and, and that, as a wine person, I found really, really disturbing so that's why I wanted to make sure that, you know, if it was Scotch, it should have Scottish barley. And if it's Isla, it should have Isla barley. And that was the, the driving force behind the terroir project. But then when you, when you see farmers on a local basis comparing and contrasting their own field and seeing how that energized them, you know, that they could see a result from their work. And therefore, there was an involvement, which I found very inspiring. And we took that to Ireland with the same concept, the same idea. And there we've got 40 different farms growing barley for us. Each one we can harvest and distill separately. We've got complete data control over every single aspect of it. So we really can drill down into the detail. And I can demonstrate, I can prove that this barley produces that flavor and we can demonstrate it to, 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 to everybody because as you can imagine there's there's great suspicion from within the industry about what we're doing because uh, they don't really want it to be true because of course it, it's, it's like a pandora's box it opens up a, a lot of uh, questions which they would rather weren't asked yeah I'm nodding away here. It's something that should have happened a long time ago because the amount of junk that people, I mean, if you drink half of these drinks, the mass marketed liqueurs, they're flavored, flavored, colored, preservatives, awful things that just they are not good for you. Well, well, that's one way of looking at it. I mean, I mean, the other way, the reason they are so big is because they have to dumb it down. What I'm saying is uh, somebody who enjoys 
um, um, a good wine or good spirit is, is you don't have to have it dumbed down. It doesn't have to be. So, so I fully understand you know, why they get up to the tricks they do. I just don't agree with them. And I don't think you have to do it. There is a, an alternative way. And I think as a consumer, you know, we've been, we led up the garden path. You know, I can remember in the sort of 80s, you know, London Bitter and, you know, Watney's and all that sort of dumb beer, that standardized, homogenized beer that, that sort of, you know, was just bleu. Uh, and then you've got the, you know, camera and you've got the, you know, microbreweries that grew up and, and have changed the, um, the horizon. Thank God. Yeah. I can remember being, you know, one of the, the sort of seminal moments for me was being at the launch of a, a, of a Canadian beer that had arrived in the UK. It was in a wine bar in uh, Soho, the launch party. And I was there. This guy came up to me and said, well, you know, what do you think? You know, one of the production people, well, what do you think of this? You know, uh, and one of the marketing guys. And I, I said, well, you know, I, I did that thing of nodded and sort of smiled and, you know, well done, jolly good and all that sort of. And I thought, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him. And I said, I can't taste anything. And he just smiled at me. And I said, and I, you didn't hear me. I, I, just, I just said, I can't taste anything. And he nodded. And he said, isn't that good? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, well, if, if you can't taste anything, you drink more. And if you drink more, we sell more. And if we sell more, we make more money. And so that's the whole point. And I just thought, oh, ye gods. I thought, and that, that's when you realize that you know, the whole thing, you know, how fucked up the whole thing is. Uh, yeah. um, you know, this, this dumbing it down, chill filtering it, middle of the road. It's like, listen, you know, it's, it's like drinking Radio 2, you know, uh, you know it, it's why? Well, surely, surely, you know, there must be more flavorsome, more individuality. We can't just have this conformity. And thank God I wasn't the only one because, you know, you, you have this camera movement, which has done wonders for, uh, you know, the horizon, the beer horizon. But who was doing this? You know, what were we going to do about you know whiskey? And that, and that's when so that's been one of the driving forces for me is is about you know this kickback to against homogeneity and standardisation and all the commercial processes that, that that are employed and that coincides with you know this you know organic and biodynamic movements of going back to the farming how it's made and how you can if you pay attention and you look closely, how you can harness those variables to make something interesting, honest, different, intriguing. And then of course, if you then put them together, you can make something very, very complex. And that's yeah. uh, my raison d'etre in this industry. But underneath all of that, it's, it's deeper than that, isn't it? It's, it's actually wanting to well, how go in. you want? But but what I mean is, is it it's it's deeper than that in terms of like ethics. It's it's going into that community and saying, look, we want you to grow something. We're going to pay you a reasonable amount of money to do it, and and we want you know you're giving someone passion back for what they're doing. I mean, to be honest, you know that that is a, a byproduct. That's not the, that's not the, I'm not some, it's not some holistic sort of thing we're, we're doing here. You know, uh, you, know, you know, this is a business, you know, we're, yeah, we're yeah. doing it seriously, commercially. There are tremendous spin-offs. And I think that is what is overlooked in business, uh, in, in my view, is, is, is the ancillary uh, benefits that come from a, a certain viewpoint or a certain sort of a, avenue that one goes down so if you go to isla and you go to growing barley on isla you know when you get farmers coming up to you you know almost in tears you know thanking you for making them you know grow barley again uh, because it, it reminds them of how farming used to be you know instead of this solitary you know one man and a tractor you know you know it, it, there's a community spirit is uh, um, uh, rekindled you know, when it comes to harvest time and, and getting somebody's crop in before the rain comes and borrowing and sharing machinery, you know, you know, this, this, you know that's obviously very satisfying. It's very, very good to know. When you see farmers buying new tractors and you think, well, that's, that's down to me. You know, it's very satisfying. 
when you see the satisfaction of a farmer when he sees his name on a bottle, you know, that he grew the barley in that bottle, you know, it's, it's a very satisfying thing. It, it's, it's not rocket science. It, it, it's human instinct, surely. It, you know, on, on Grenada, um, this island, which I discovered in a serendipitous way, through my FD, John Adams, and a, a university friend of his who happened to have a house there. You know, after 10 years looking for somewhere to put my project, I stumbled across Grenada. The only trouble was there was no sugarcane. The island used to be extremely productive, but following a, a sort of Marxist coup in the 70s, the, 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 the Marxists had shut down agriculture on the premise that it was colonial and capitalist and therefore had to go. So right. they literally just shut it down, put 50% of the island's workforce out of work and forced everything else to be imported from, from neighboring islands and therefore the cost of living to, 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 to increase. You know, complete, you know, bulls up. Yeah, but yeah. When I turned up uh, in 2015, there was no cane growing on the island. Wow. Um, so the first thing is, well, you know, what do you, what are we, get, we what are we going to do? Can we grow cane again? Now, of course, the estates, the 125 estates that were extremely prolific and profitable, had been broken up and divvied up into small units and, and given away to uh, islanders. But of course, very few of them knew what to do with them or had the knowledge or the equipment to do anything with them. And so they just reverted back to jungle, bush. So when I traveled around that island, all I saw was bush, 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 bush everywhere. And in fact, funny enough, there's an old film uh, from 1957 called Island in the Sun. You can see it on YouTube. And, you know, if you watch the film, which is with James Mason and Joan Collins, funny enough, is actually a very good film in its own right. But if you actually look at the scenery, you can see what the islands used to look like. And it was a hive of activity. And that had all gone wow. um, for, for, for a political reason. And so, so my idea was to go to these farmers and say, look, you've got five acres and three acres of ground. I will give you the cane. I will show you what to do. I will pay you a guaranteed rate, more than you ever, ever had before. All you have to do is tend it, look after it, and we'll show you what to do. And wow. for three years, I've been trying to persuade farmers to do that. And not one single farmer rose to the challenge. Not one. So over that period, we've ended up having to do it ourselves. And so in that Grenada project, starting with this great idea of powering farmers to grow cane, it's turned into the fact that we are now farmers growing cane. So we've basically leased the rump parts of the estates, those 120 estates, the eight or so that still remain, and employ farmers to, to do it for us. But that wasn't the principle. The principle was originally to get farmers to do it themselves. But there was a great suspicion about the project. There was a great suspicion about me, um, about you know, what we were trying to do. And so consequently, no one was prepared to actually bite the bullet. So, yeah. so you know, even with the best laid plans, it doesn't always work out the way you thought it would. Yeah. It's a great island. I went there when I was 15. And I remember meeting a gentleman. I was drinking some rum at the time. Probably shouldn't have been. But... Uh, I, I, bet I met this gentleman and he said, I remember him saying to me, in, in, I'm going to try and copy what he said to me in, in, the, in the Grenadian accent. He said, it was much better when the British were here, is what he basically said. And I think that probably, because he was probably in his 60s or 70s. So he would remember, I would imagine, you're talking about the coup that would yeah. have happened after they kicked the English out, right? That's what yeah. you're talking about. Well, well, yes, you know, it's actually a very interesting socio-political issue. You know, you've got the post-war 1946, uh, 45, 46, and, and the estate owners, the alert ones, realised that, you know, the writing was on the wall. The Brits couldn't maintain these colonies. In fact, you know, 
Churchill you know, had to actually, you know, part of the thing of um, getting American assistance in the war was, was you know, had to admit that, you know, after the war, people would be, be uh, self-determined governments, that they would, they would have their own uh, independence. And basically, you know, in, in, you know, the point, the principle was that colonialism was not to carry on. So, so a lot of the early post-war estate owners sold up and left. And then that was followed by, obviously, the writing on the wall, independence was coming, you know, the, 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 the maintenance of these islands was, was no longer possible, bankrupt UK couldn't, couldn't afford it. And so, you know, the inevitable slide towards independence was going to happen. And once independence did happen, then a lot more of these estates were broken up or sold off uh, for housing for land to the land less. And then with a, um, a Marxist coup in place, um, then, then compulsory purchase, confiscation, and a command economy trying to control everything. And of course, that just didn't work. And you know, all the best ground had been used for housing. All the flat land you know, had been used for, for, you know, for, for building estates, housing estates. So, so, you know, the Ministry of Agriculture in Grenada is now, is really a repository of all the post-Marxist educated civil servants. So, you know, this whole industry of agriculture, for political reasons, was shut down. And it's, it's proving, has proven very difficult to get it going again. So when we came along, we basically just did our own thing. Tali did our own sugarcane growing project with our own machinery our own tractors you know having to, having to show these guys how to use tractors you know i hadn't seen tractors practically the tractors basically were just mechanicalized horses as far as they're concerned so so we we've, we've, we've really had to start from the beginning showing uh, local farmers what and how you can prepare the ground uh, the latest thinking uh, in growing cane, agricultural ideas, minimal use of fertilizers and insecticides. In fact, we just we just bought a, a drone, which allows us to administer very quickly insecticides and and, and pesticides, because cane is it's susceptible to because of that climate, that very hot climate, humid climate. It's very susceptible to disease, and you need to be able to deal with it very quickly. If you don't want to have to deal with a, a, a you know an outbreak, using a drone, we're able to pinpoint the outbreaks of any infection as quickly as they occur, and therefore deal with them very quickly, and therefore use minimal amounts of chemicals, which which of course is you know it has to be a good thing. Wow, that's very clever. So 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 before it's spread, you've sort of nuked yeah. the uh... you've nuked it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, you know, we're also growing some, we, we intend to grow some cane on our house farm, which will be biodynamically grown, and also organically grown. But cane is, because of its susceptibility, because of those climates, it's, it's a it's quite, quite tricky thing to grow. You have to pay a lot of attention to it. And, and, and so we'll grow some organically, but it, we won't, not all of it. We can't, we can't risk all of it being organic. Well, thank you. That's been really educational. I, I really appreciate it. My oh, pleasure. <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> so where, where do people find you if, if, they, if they want to go and take a look at what you're up to, Mark? Oh, well, uh, there's uh, renegaderum.com. We're just launching that website now, as it happens. There will be web cameras there too. You know, we, in, in Brooklady, we did those web cameras because we wanted to show people you know, that this was a Victorian distillery we weren't just saying it, you know, um, it's Victorian. Now, in Grenada, one of the, the, the happy coincidences is that a lot of the sugar estates and the administration of those estates and the construction of those mills and distilleries in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries was all by Scott. So there in, in the undergrowth are these these remnants of these old mills and water wheels and stuff, all, all you know, sand cast in Glasgow. 
that our workforce at Renegade Rum, they're all Scottish origin. They've all got Scottish names, McSween, McTavish. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a very strong Scottish connection, which is quite amusing. Well, it amuses me, anyhow. So it's, it's, <laughs> no, sort of, it's quite it's funny, sort of, actually. Uh, no. uh, well, uh, uh, to yeah. the extent that the guy that built Brookladdy Distillery built one of the water mills over there in Grenada. So there's a lot of sort of uh, connections to, you know, the, the west coast of Scotland. So, so I, I feel it's almost like a dynastic thing we're on. We're, we're on a sort of a, a, on a roll. Well, that's brilliant. Uh, and, Wat- and Waterford Distillery is waterforddistillery.ie. There we've got, uh, again, more web cameras so you can see what's going on. A very modern, super modern, state-of-the-art distillery. Couldn't be more different to Brookladdy. But uh, it's using technology that allows us to put in place a terroir project, the likes of which has never been seen before. So, so it's, it's, it's quite impressive. That's waterforddistillery.ie. That's lovely. Well, I'll drop, I'll drop these links at the bottom, of the, uh, the bottom of the show notes and everything. And yeah, I really appreciate your time. I can't wait to see okay. how, how these distilleries sort of uh, grow over the next few years, you know. Yeah. If it's anything, <laughs> anything like Laddie, it's, it's going to be fantastic, you know. Well, yeah, with touch wood. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they all share the same ethos. You know, they all come from the same place. Brook Laddie, we took on an industry that was focused around blended whiskey uh, rather than single malt. And we were there promoting the idea of barley and single malt quality whiskey. Irish whiskey, well, it had been in the doldrums for years. It had been a monopoly in the power of Pernod Ricard for at least 40 years. That is a very exciting Wild West era where things are changing very fast and is in a very exciting place to be. And of course, the best quality barley in the world, which is why I'm there. And then wow. take it to, to rum. Well, you know, it's the same companies. It's the same Diageo's, Perno, Ricard's, Bacardi, the same big guys with the same marketing philosophies, uh, which are all to do with marketing and very little to do with production. And, and so once again, we're challenging them. Uh, you know, there is a different way of doing it. There is a different way of looking at it. And yes, small companies can survive and can grow and and can be influential um if you do it right and that's what we're trying to do fantastic that's great oh, it's really lovely to uh, lovely to watch this you know i'm fascinated i love i love to watch businesses grow especially especially in the drinks industry because it's a it's a fun it's a fun industry to be in you know it really is well we get, we, <laughs> yes and no it's interesting it, it, it's it promotes itself. I mean, I, I, think, I think to a lot of people outside, it, it looks like a terribly good fun industry to be in. You know, everybody's terribly jolly and, and it's all lovely things you talk about. And, uh, but I think, uh, you know, I think what people forget is it's an industry. The clue's in the name. It's an industry. It's a very powerful industry and it's a very consolidated one. In whiskey terms, 60% of whiskey is controlled by two companies. In, in rum, it's even worse. In Irish whiskey, 75% is controlled by one company. It, wow. it, it, it's, you know, it's a very, very sophisticated industry. And I suppose what I'm trying to do is make it less, less, less sophisticated and taking it back to the ground, taking it back to the beginning and starting again. And that's what I'm doing. If you could see me, I'm just nodding. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, that, that's really interesting on the on the telephone. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe and wherever you prefer, share with your friends. And if you enjoyed the show, drop us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen. Mm-hmm.